Hello, Journeyers. It's a great day to go exploring religions in New York City. I'm Tony Carnes, your host for A Journey Through NYC Religions Television. As we transition out of COVID, hopefully, religious organizations are returning to in-person worship. Also, many of the great a generation of religious leaders from after the 1980s are beginning the transition out of leadership and bring in new leaders. And we are in the midst of an intense mayoral campaign to secede Mayor de Blasio. What is going to happen after our COVID moment? What kind of leaders do we need for the post-pandemic city? What kind of leaders do we need in our religious organizations, our churches, our synagogues, our mosques? We're getting quite a bit of transition and we need to be thinking about those questions. To help us answer these questions, we've asked Aaron Wren, a notable uh, urban analyst, to come help us answer them. Welcome to the program, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Aaron is uh, was one of the nation's best urban analysts at the Manhattan Institute and is uh, a contributing editor to their magazine, a City Journal. He also has a newsletter called Heartland Intelligence, which gives shrewd perceptions and advice to Midwestern cities. And he sends out a, a very intriguing title, uh, The Masculinist which is about men and family and society. It's filled with uh, good advice and sometimes sobering observations. We will link to his works on our website. Uh, Aaron, in the post-COVID period, we're undergoing transition leadership, uh, both in the city itself, New York City, and also, uh, um, in our religious organizations. Uh, what kind of leader do we need and what kind are we likely to get? We're having, I see all types of stresses going on in the, the after COVID and after the woke uh, generations coming on. Uh, what kind of leader do we need and what kind are we likely to get? Yes, well, I would say we have not gotten the caliber of leader that we deserve in America. Um, I think that's a widely shared sentiment. There's uh, widespread dissatisfactions. Uh, now, not all those people, uh, you know, agree with each other. You know, the, the Trump voters certainly don't agree with the, the people who are supporting, say, the DSA or who are Bernie Sanders voters. But I think there's a lot of uh, dissatisfaction. And frankly, at the macro level, uh, you know, economic results in America haven't been that great since about 2000. Uh, you know, we've had relatively low growth, tremendous inequality. And I think the key stat that we see is that actually life expectancy in the United States has started to decline. I mean, that's crazy to think that we have declining life expectancy, uh, in, you know, which is something we expect out of, say, Eastern Europe in the post-industrial era, opioids, et cetera. So we haven't had uh, the leadership that we deserve. When I think about leadership of institutions, of governments, of churches, I think about it in, there's three real dimensions that I look at it. One is, uh, which, I, which I say it's about managing for a long-term institutional credibility. And, and so the three things that I say are, one, it's about integrity, and then it's about competence, uh, and then it's, it's about kind of, um, you know, kind of missional integrity, so if you will. So first, kind of called personal integrity is, you know, are you honest? Are you not, uh, you know, a lot of these churches, you know, for example, we see a lot of sexual abuse scandals. You know, there's just, there's just totally unacceptable. Uh, there's a lot of people who've gotten very rich uh, off, of, off of their uh, kind of ministries, buying Gulfstream jets and the like. Um, so, you know, I'm not suggesting that we can ever get to a corruption-free politics, for example. Uh, but having someone just, you know, kind of baseline, you, you know, baseline integrity of leaders is very important. You know, secondly, is competence. And, and the fact is, this is where we're really falling down on the job in America. I mean, if you look at this COVID pandemic response, frankly, you know, I, I'd have to say we didn't do all that great. Certainly, it was going to be a challenge no matter what. Um, but now we're, you know, we're seeing things like this Vanity Fair reporting on, you know, the lab leak hypothesis. And again, I don't take any stand on what might have happened, but we see that people who had blatant conflicts of interest were lying and issuing statements that they knew were not true at the time about it, in order to try to shut it down. Uh, and, you know, our 
our results were far uh, m- much poorer than East Asian countries. You know, China had a, an initial problem. If you look at South Korea, if you look at Japan, if you look at Singapore, if you look at Taiwan, uh, these places did much better than the United States and Western Europe. Uh, so competence is important. And then lastly, missional integrity, which is, you know, what is this organization supposed to actually be doing? Uh, what results is it supposed to be delivering? Uh, and focusing on that and not allowing them to be, you know, essentially redirected to political or other ends. So I think if we, if we could do all those things, um, it, it, you know, that's really the kinds of leaders we should be looking for. People of base, you know, basic personal integrity, uh, people who are competent and know how to actually lead organizations and deliver results, and then people who are going to keep the organization on mission. Well, let me ask you, let's take a hypothetical situation. Mm-hmm. Let's say you are on a pastoral search committee, and you want to operationalize those three concerns into right. questions that would really produce results. How would you do that? Uh, well, you know, again, if you look at it, like, I mean, I, hopefully you're doing, uh, you're doing some basic vetting uh, on the, on these people. I think it's, it's a little challenging because a lot of the, um, you know, kind of a lot of the abuse of authority things only come later down the road once you've acquired some authority, um, you know, for example. But I think if we look at the qualifications for, uh, if you look at the qualifications for, uh, you know, elder, you know, slash bishop in, in the Bible, they tend to be predominantly those of, you know, personal care, you know, personal character, you know, not fond of wine, not overly loving money, you know, husband of one wife, those sorts of things. So presumably you're doing uh, some sort of baseline um, I- integrity check there. I think you have to look at what, you know, the, what are the results they've achieved uh, historically and, and the roles that they, they've been able to do. So you, you do have to look at, at that relative to, you know, what was set out, um, you know, as the mission. And then I think, you know, you have to look at uh, the, I think the other thing you have to look at, I think the missional integrity is, is like the big part uh, of a lot of this. And this is where people run into trouble because I think so many people are essentially blown here and there by the winds uh, and whatever kind of the, you know, whatever the kind of the secular zeitgeist of the moment is uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of where the directions are going, uh, you know, people tend to go to them. So like all these, you know, a lot of these churches all of a sudden started to, you know, the, the, about five years ago, I started noticing this, maybe seven years ago, but it really took a hard turn into you know, race issues. And, you know, very different from say someone like John Perkins, you know, who's been focused on that his whole, his whole life, his whole career. All of a sudden it's like the culture takes a woke turn. We take a woke turn, it, right, right along with it. Uh, and so you, what you see in my view is like, that was not something that came out of a religious context, but it was essentially being driven by essentially market demand in society. And you would just ask, okay, great. If this is something that we've missed, if this is something that was this huge issue, all the people who failed to be covering it, why are they still running the show? <laughs> right? They, they, would have, they should have been admitting that they botched it. So I think this idea, and it doesn't have to be that, maybe you jumped on the Trump politics bandwagon. You know? So I think people who are dr- kind of driven by, driven by the trends, uh, and who have not shown that they're willing to take stands that essentially put them at odds, uh, you, you know, with any, you know, with, you know, with society or maybe even with their own flock in some important ways. At some point, you have to show that you're willing to, to make a stand for something. And this is where I see that a lot of, uh, a lot of people really have it. Like in the church world, this is what I see. I see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of leaderships that have, you know, has really tried to, especially since since the collapse of essentially the religious right back in the post-Reagan era, we entered this sort of um, world where I think there's been much more you know, cultural engagement. I think a lot of people have tried to avoid conflict and avoid things. And I don't think there's anything, I don't, I don't want to be pro-conflict, but at some point, right, are you willing to, uh, you know, take a stand against some of your own people, maybe? Are you able to take a stand against some of the cultural trends? I think that's really this ability to have integrity in the sense of a structural integrity, like a ship on the sea where the wind and the waves are bearing down on you. Are you going to be able to withstand that pressure? Or are you simply going to crumple and deform under that pressure? And I think in a world where there is a lot of pressure coming in from all the sides on these leaders, I do think part of it is they're going to have to decide what they stand for, what's their core, 
and be willing to stay true to that, you know, even at the cost, I, I think at the cost maybe of, um, you know, that they're not going to be able to please everybody. Maybe some people are going to leave their churches. Maybe it's going to be a little smaller church. And so that's why I say, I think when you look at competence, competence, I think has always been viewed of, you know, in terms of numbers, right? Are we, are we growing? Is the money coming in? You know, are we expanding? Uh, but I, yeah, that's why I say, that's why I wouldn't divorce it from sort of missional integrity. Uh, so I think that's really going to be, I think it's really going to be a point. I mean, you know, the churches are getting essentially, uh, in a lot of ways, kind of ripped apart by masks, by I mean, talk about crazy stuff, right? And so uh, it's very hard, but I think, you know, just saying, this is our position, right? This is where we, not that you mightn't change it if you think you legitimately were wrong on something, but I think it's really important to say, right, this is where we stand and show that someone can actually take some heat. Uh, well, that's very important. Well, you, you might want to take heat, but then again, you might be creating heat where you don't have to. The debate among many of these yep. churches and uh, synagogues, I would say, is exactly the debate that we get in politics. Is there, is there a center so that left and right can some have a common ground to speak at? That is, is there a central platform, not necessarily central politics, but a central platform that people can come together and disagree? Uh, second, the, there have been some long-term trends among uh, 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 churches in particular of uh, theologians um, uh, drifting uh, toward uh, uh, sort of uh, drifting toward extremes or toward left or right. And you see this in the younger pastors when they join in one particular network, uh, they become woke. Uh, they've joined another network. They become uh, Trumpians maybe. Right. And so what does the uh, church that says, well, we don't, I would say if I went to the uh, largest um, uh, churches in Manhattan, you would get something like this. Um, you would get uh, the majority want um, the teaching of the Bible are, are better depth than their doctrine. Uh, the living out of Jesus in their life, so that becomes an important characteristic of the pastor, not just integrity, but actually you can see uh, Jesus uh, actually living out in his life, what, uh, that uh, it, he's, uh, he looks like a person that's genuine to, uh, genuinely coming out of the uh, biblical tradition. And finally, uh, you have about a substantial, significant group that wants uh, woke politics in the church, and you have a significant group that absolutely doesn't want woke mm -hmm. politics. And the question is, uh, and I've seen no, a number of these churches, so you can see in their hiring, uh, some hire from networks that are woke, and then the staff starts driving the direction, the type of readings you have, the type of uh, programs you have, the types of um, uh, what's uh, seen as good. And some of these churches are saying, wait a moment, do we want really that split? I, I think one of the... Um, resignations at Redeemer was related to how do you, was because the pastor himself did not feel he could bridge those tensions. Mm -hmm. uh, he was more, a little bit more woke than the others, and but he had a lot of integrity. Uh, uh, he did not want to, to betray people's trust. And so he felt like that really it was best for him in a big surprise move. Nobody was pushing him at the time. Uh, uh, he decided, you know, I just can't do this with good integrity. But it mm -hmm. still left all the people he brought on staff, all the uh, literature about uh, social justice and woke and so forth. And now the uh, your your this your pastoral selection has to figure out. Well, how do we get somebody to bridge this? I think this is true. Well, maybe maybe you can't. You know, and uh, yeah. you know, I think that's part of it, this idea that can't we all just get along idea, you know, I think is, um, you know, one that uh, that isn't there. Now, I, I you know it's interesting. I, I attend a church here in Indianapolis that, you know, like they were basically very explicit 
we don't talk about controversial issues. <laughs> Basically, it's very moderate church. And, uh, you, you know, it's like, you know, not, moderate means no controversial issues. Yeah, yeah basically. So it's, um, yeah, you know, they're basically like, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to preach about these controversial issues. You know, they explicitly say we want to be a big tent where people who believe these different things and these different issues, not to say that people might not discuss them, but we're not going to, we're not going to preach that from the pulpit. Um, so, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see about that. Now I would say like, look at this one. Here's the thing about woke. Like if you truly believe like, Hey, you know, this woke thing is absolutely true and is absolutely the thing that we need to be addressing in our church and our society. Now, then you have to take a stand on that, I think. And this idea that, um, uh, so I, but I think this idea that you, that you can't, we're, we're in a sort of this, this phase in which a lot of the old alignments and uh, groupings are kind of disintegrated. We see it in politics, right? We saw it with kind of the the, the, the Republican Party took this turn towards Trumpism, and a lot of the traditional people said, you know, the George Wills and the Bill Crystals and a lot of these guys, like, they became the Never Trump movement. They're like, we're out of here. A lot of them have rejected their party affiliation. They went hard left. They really, and, and so you start, you, you're really seeing uh, these old, um, you know, a lot of these old alliances um, really uh, uh, doing it. Somebody tweeted something the other day that they seem to have deleted, uh, deleted but they mentioned like a whole bunch of Southern Baptist people like Al Mohler and Greg Thornberry and Russell Moore and Owen Strand and on down the line. They said, look, five years ago, these guys would have all been right next to each other, you know, very unified in their thinking. And now they're all over the map. This guy's over here. This guy's over here. This guy's over here. This guy's over here. And so we're seeing what used to be these aligned groups of people. There's this reconfiguration going on. And I think in some respects, that is, you have to be you know, and I think, uh, I do think there's an element, uh, and I'm not saying we should always be d divisive, we should be seeking division, I think we should be seeking unity, but I think there is this sense in which, you know, uh, there there are there are kind of things that divide, sometimes there are, divide. Jesus even talked about it, I think, in, in his in his message, and and so I do think, well, you know, this idea, says we, we want to divide over the resurrection, right, not, not yeah. over uh, uh, right. Uh, Galatians, uh, uh, what's the meaning of uh, neither Jew nor Gentile right. slave or free? Yeah, well, I think it'll be, I mean, this idea that there is a sense in which, okay, uh, yeah, you can say that. So I'm like, you know, where, where do you say, but this idea that like, okay, great, what's what's a peripheral issue? What's a central issue? But this, I think this idea that you'll square the circle and you'll find some, that there's some third way, right? Like a Bill Clinton or a Tony Blair type third way that if we just take this third way, if we just find this path, mm -hmm. we're going to be able to, reconcile all of this stuff. And I think realistically, um, realistically, it's not going to happen. I think there are just, there are some fundamental divergences. And by the way, I think that what you see is it's never going to be about one issue, right? It's never going to be about one issue because what you see is all these issue complexes are very linked together. And, you know, uh, it, it, it's like, uh, you know, so it's just like the Republican Democrat, they, they have all these issues that you wouldn't necessarily think they all go together, but people tend to agree on all of them. Uh, yeah, and, and so, um, yeah, I do think there's a sense in which we're, we're kind of migrating towards more division in society that's somewhat going to be mirrored. Um, it's somewhat going to be mirrored in the church. We just have to, we just have to accept that we're sort of in this, this kind of, um, kind of disintegrating, reconfiguring, um, kind of reconfiguring age. And, you know, the leader has to, one of the things the leader has to figure out is answer those questions. What is something I'm willing to see people leave the church over? Where do I want to make the stand? And having the wisdom to do that and the integrity to do that, I think is important. But at some point, you're going to have to displease some people, you know? And so I just, I just think, you know, you have to be willing to do it. I mean, there was just, um, you know, I, I really, um, here's an example. I'll just take an example here from, from Indianapolis. And, um, you know, the head of one of the big local agencies uh, was just basically slandered by a bunch of activists. And I know all of the leaders in this community um, know who this, this woman is personally. They know that these things are untrue, and yet none of them will publicly defend her. None of them is going to say a word. It's like, you know, so you see this stuff, it's like, no, I'm not going to expose myself to mob attack by defending my own friend, by the way, whose husband just died of cancer a couple months ago, and they're just leaving her to twist in the wind. And it's not like she's going to get fired or lose her job or anything like that. But like this idea that you won't even stand up 
for people who you know are being sick. It's like, those are little things. It's like, I see such moral cowardice, uh, you, you know, in, in these things. And so we, and I'm not saying we only, we all only have so many chips. Okay. We only have so many chips and we got to decide where we're going to play those chips. Uh, but I think that's part of it. You know, leaders have to decide, I got this, I got this many chips. Where am I going to place them? Where am I going to put them? Where's it going to go? And I think that's very important. And right now, these people aren't, a lot of people aren't playing any chips. You know, they're kind of taking. Well, let me ask you, I know you've uh, given some uh, thought and talk about the Bandcamp example. Uh, at Bandcamp. Uh, Basecamp, Basecamp. Basecamp, right. Base I think camp, it's Basecamp, Basecamp, yeah. Yes, that's right. Uh, I use it some, uh, but uh, you never can write, quite remember the name. Yeah. Basecamp, they, they are a pretty progressive or leftist organization. No, to be sure. And yet the two founders, particularly one of them, they had the acting, uh, I guess he's the CEO, decided that the political discussions were just tearing apart the workplace. So he banned political discussions uh, from the workplace, and and evidently um, there's been a pretty significant twenty uh, percent of the people or so announced that they're leaving. He offered them a buyout if they wanted to leave. Yeah. Well, yeah. is that going to work? Is he going to be able to have a non-political uh, work environment, or is it just sort of uh, uh, you know the uh, captain at the ship that's going down and he says throw out the anchors, <laughs> but it's impossible. <laughs> No, I think what I think that you got a hold of what's going I mean, on. I, th I think that's a great example. So Basecamp is a privately held company. There are really two main owners, and Jeff Bezos owns a small amount of the company. I think, and they, you know, these are things. These are far lefty guys, okay, yeah. in their own right, and they're like, we're running a software company here, okay. So we actually have to. That's what I mean by missional integrity. The, the mission of our company is to sell like this project management software, this email software, this. The, we're in this kind of collaboration software business, and if politics takes us away from that. We won't have a business. And so you, you basically see that the same thing happened um, with Coinbase. And so, yeah, a third of their employees quit. They offered them a buyout. A third of them quit. And, um, you know, but they took a stand. I mean, this is, these are guys that took a stand. And they took a stand, I think, knowing that the hit jobs from the media were going to start coming after them. Because what happens? Like when Coinbase did the same thing. They said, look, we're going to be focused on, you know, we're going to be focused on our mission, which is, you know, cryptocurrency. Okay. We're not going to become a, we're not going to become an organization. It's, it's all around politics. You know, the New York times just starts writing hit jobs on them. You know, they're racist, they're this, they're, you know, you know, so, you know, the hit jobs are going to come in the media and um, you know, you, you know, they're going to come, you know, people are going to write about you and they're like, look, we're going to make this decision anyway, because this is the right thing for us to do for our business. And I think in both cases, it seems to have worked out, you know, so far. Obviously, well, the bigger... started. We don't know yet, right? Right. Yeah, well, Coinbase is still doing quite well. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, certainly, I think one of the things that's happened is, right, okay, you take, a, you take a decision that alienated a third of your workforce and they quit. Yes, but those decisions are going to attract other people, right? And I, I can tell you, like, there are a lot of people uh, in corporate America, who, I mean, again, they're not, they're not conservatives. These are people on the left. They're like, man, this, this like craziness that's going on in our companies is insane. They don't like it. And, um, you know, so they're, you know, the idea that they can work for a company that's like, you know, sane is, you know, something that, that I think could be attractive to a lot of people, especially for a company like Basecamp that isn't that big. They don't need a huge number of employees. They don't need to find another 4,000 so employees. They, they need to hire, find like 15 employees. You're telling me there aren't 15 software developers in the country that wouldn't kill to work at a place where they didn't have to deal with politics all day? There's a lot of them. So, um, you know, and not to say, look, you're going to have customers. So what's going to happen? The political people at your customers are going to start agitating. You get dropped and all this stuff. So it's like, you know, you know, there are prices to be paid, but they just, you know, they were able to make a decision. And I think that's, that's an important thing that, you know, they're willing to make a decision. And, um, well, let me uh, shift off from the leadership for a moment to the post-COVID. What's going to be the impact of COVID on the churches? Um, are they going to end up uh, in the future uh, shrinking? Are people that got used to not going to church are, are going to go virtual? Or will they uh, have a new restart and uh, a, a new freshness about what they're doing? 
it reminds me a little bit of the debate over remote work. Everybody's prognosticating, but nobody really knows for sure what's going to happen. Right. Uh, you know, there were a lot of research, you know, uh, people suggesting, you know, a significant number of churches were going to go under uh, a, as a result of this. Um, you know, kind of, again, I don't have hard data, you know, but what I, uh, you know, what I see is, um, you know, that a lot of, I, you know, I'm told a lot of church plants, particularly in big cities, really took a hit, may have gotten folded because they just, you know, they, if you were just getting started on something and, you know, you don't have a lot of money and a lot of resources that those guys probably really took a hit. So a lot of the newer ones kind of took a hit. Um, you know, I hear that there's been, uh, you know, people are moving around between churches uh, on account of a few factors. One is, are they meeting or not meeting? <laughs> and so, Churches that have been meeting, you know, you're hearing, oh, but there's a lot of new people coming in the door because they're meeting. Uh, you know, will they stay? I don't know. Secondly, I think it's kind of crazy to think, but masks has been a, a dividing, big dividing line for people. And then this woke politics is becoming a dividing line as well. And so, um, you know, what? I, so, so I think those things, and I think there is this sense that some people have just picked a church online and they're going to stay remote. And so I, I think it will be interesting to see. Uh, I don't think there's going to be as big a blowout am, among churches as may, may have been expected. Um, I've also heard giving for most churches has remained pretty strong. Uh, so I, I, think we'll, I think we'll have to see. I do think there's, there's going to be a reallocation of people among churches over some of these issues. How exactly it'll play out, uh, not clear. Well, uh, established churches like, let's say, the Catholic Church, uh, are the mainland church or, or, or historical churches uh, uh, benefit more because they show stability? And we've just got a little bit of time. So give yeah, me well, you know, what I would say is, you know, you know, to some extent, if you had a building and could control your own destiny, uh, that counted for something because, you know, you weren't at the mercy of landlords telling you you couldn't meet or couldn't open or all of that stuff. Um, you know, the, the trend in main lines has definitely been going the wrong direction um, in terms of uh, in terms of membership. I, you know, I think it, I think it'll be I think it remains to be seen. I do think some of the younger churches that were had not really fully become self-sustaining are going to take, you know, are going to take a hit. We'll, we'll just have to see how it plays out. Well, we're really glad that you could come and share it briefly with us, uh, but with your wisdom and insight. My name is Tony Carnes. I'm uh, your host for a journey through uh, 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 New York City Religions Television. I'm here with Aaron Wren. Please check out the website and also on our Sunday program to, uh, uh, in this uh, programs this summer. Good day. Bye. <laughs>